Hi, I'm Thais Skogstad, and I lead product marketing here at data.world. Before we dive in, uh, it probably makes sense to quickly give some information on who we are. As the only cloud native catalog recognized in Gartner's Magic Quadrant, um, Data World offers a new way to multiply the business value from data. We help connect, align, and get more value from the intelligence, tools, and processes that are powering your business. Our cloud native platform creates a single view of your data from multiple sources so more people in the business can find, understand, and of course, use it. Built to include more of your business, data.world makes data from anywhere meaningful to anyone so your people can quickly and confidently answer your business questions, capture their work, and add it all to your company's body of knowledge. And when your data strategy needs to adapt to emerging circumstances, knowing what data you have, where it lives, and how it is used goes to a long way towards your success. Now, let me welcome our speakers today. Uh, we um, are very glad to host Teresa Kushner and Tim Gasper. Um, with further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce, get past to Teresa, and please, um, would you introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Hi, I'm Theresa Kushner. I am a consultant uh, with NTT Data in Dallas, Texas, and I manage for NTT Data the practice called Data as an Asset. I'm also very involved with their AI COE and analytics in that part of the world. And I'm here because one of the things that NTT Data just did is that today we have launched our brand new entry into um, how we're going to manage data, how data and data assets need to be managed. And we've started that with a big survey that we did that looked at a lot of customers and what kinds of issues they're having now that the lockdowns and the, the pandemics have hit us all. What we are actually doing with making sure that data islands get transformed into data insights. So to, to give you a little bit of a background on this, our survey comes out today. You can read it in full force on the NTT website. But what we actually found is that most organizations, 80% of you guys out there, view your data as an asset, which is great. That's why you're on this call, because you're trying to figure out how to manage that asset with data.world. But still, executives are wrestling with how to make their organizations data-driven. And that's going to be something that's going to be difficult, too. You've got a lot of data. You just don't necessarily know what to do with it all the time, where to use it, and why to use it. And again, one of the things that we've seen time and time again, and this study just proved it out even more, is that we have decades of challenges with data that are still sitting in some of our rot, our redundant, obsolete, or trivial data stores. So our data silos and lack of leadership are causing some of our data not to be able to be used, along with quality, integrity, uh, integration, and security, the challenges are very effective, our, our challenges are out there, and we're having them managing our data. Strong data governance gives structure to process during uncertain times. And that's one of the bottom lines of our survey. There were three things that we wanted to make sure that our customers and our sales teams understood about the survey. Three things that we took away. One, culture is key to realizing data value. Championing a data-driven culture from the top down is absolutely a necessity. The second most important thing is that once you have that governance and how you manage that, how you manage the data in the organization is the second most important thing you can do. So establishing a strong data governance operation to secure collaborative relationships around your data is most important. And then finally, and third and last is technology itself. Don't go looking to technology to solve your governance issues immediately. But when you find good, when you find good technology like data.world, you might apply it that way in order to accelerate your investments. So thank you. And I'll turn it back to Tyson now. 
Sure, and uh, I want to say thank you and um, let us, our audience know that we can share the results from the survey as well. So with that, let me welcome Tim. Um, Tim, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today, and we're really excited to uh, uh, to first of all have our, our our guest and expert here at the RISA to uh, to walk through some of what's going on from their perspective from NTT and and be able to uh, uh, sort of talk about um, how we can do governance better and sort of the state of governance right now, uh, but also introduce some new and exciting concepts. So um, I'm, I'm our director of product over at Data World. Um, I, I work uh, with our with our engineering teams as well as our customers to really figure out how we use data catalogs and how we use data governance. To, uh, to create value for enterprises. Um, and, uh, and today I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through some, some slides that go through a little bit of um, sort of the methodology that we're looking at, um, as well as um, uh, show you a little bit of software at the end and, and actually let you take a peek. We'll look at, take a, a sneak peek at, uh, at some of the, uh, the underlying features uh, that we think really support uh, a better and, uh, and a differentiated approach to governance. Uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so that should be showing up now. And uh, I wanna start off by just talking a little bit about the traditional model around governance. And so obviously this idea of data governance is not new, it's been around for a while, right? Um, and the idea around data governance um, is to really wrap our hands around the data that we have and the, and the activities happening around data in our organizations uh, to ensure that that information is being managed properly, right? Uh, and we've got this sort of this distinction of data management, the actual work with the data, and then data governance, which is a little bit more of a sort of a, you know, a defining, enforcing, auditing, and controlling force uh, to make sure that we're doing things well, we're doing things right, uh, and, uh, and we don't get in trouble, right? Uh, there's definitely a strong defensive mentality, traditionally, uh, around data governance. And you end up getting some common roles uh, in, in sort of your different organizations around, uh, around governance and around how these programs are implemented. Um, and, um, and some of those common roles are, for example, data stewards, right? Stewardship is very much a key topic in data governance and how do we take care of our data? How do we ensure that we have high quality data? Who are the experts that we talk to in terms of how to use data effectively? We have concepts like data custodians, which I think are a little less common. Um, I think for, for those that are very, very into sort of the realm of, of data governance, perhaps that's uh, something you're more familiar with or sort of regulatory compliance, but sort of the, the people who have to take care of the data themselves, typically the more technical people. Now, when you bubble up more to the strategic side, you have sort of your data trustees who are maybe uh, the people who are thinking about the policies or the standards at a high level in your organization. Right. They probably don't actually have the title data trustee. That's just a hat they wear. And that's actually a common theme among these is that they're often hats you wear. With maybe the exception being the data architect. There are a lot of people who have that role in our companies. And they are looking at technically how are the right ways to sort of design our systems to manage that data effectively and govern it effectively. And you may have programs in your organization that are things like a governance council, or perhaps you're thinking of putting that kind of uh, a council together so that they can actually go and, and, uh, and, and review your policies, approve new initiatives, uh, and, and ensure that things don't go off the rails, right? It's, it's a mechanism by which to provide executive oversight. Um, and, and just before we move into some additional sort of analysis and topics on this, um, I was wondering if maybe I could loop you in a little bit, Theresa, and ask you a question here. Um, you know, is this, uh, you know, uh, the common model that you see in a lot of the businesses and sort of the, the, the clients you work with at NTT? And um, is there anything that you would kind of add in terms of, you know, what is the typical approach to governance that you see very often these days? Yeah, I say this all the time. In fact, that's a very common approach to the way that we recommend things and the way that it normally gets delivered inside an organization. I, I will stress that one of the things that's important is to find the subject matter expertise within your organization. And oftentimes that is the data steward because they are at the heart of everything. They are the people who understand the data the most and the ones that you can rely on to feed information to the, the next appropriate level. The other thing I found, and just is just a caution, you see that little, um, that on your chart, it's very, very, uh, 
evident is there is a, a barrier. So it's, it's a line between data steward and trustee. And there's a line between steward and custodian. That line is where the magic happens in that the stewards have got to be able to translate what they do into a way a trustee can understand. And so I think that that's one of the things that data.world that I've seen that it can help you do is make that transition between data steward and trustee and data steward and custodian from the business to the technical and from the different layers within the organization. I think that's an excellent point and thank you, Theresa. I think that um, I think that's going to be a theme that we see throughout this presentation here is that the ability for communication and collaboration to happen across these lines is critical because simply defining these roles and putting this sort of traditional um, uh, platform in place um, is a very, very important step, but it can leave a lot of things missing still. And I think that's that's where we'll kind of go next, which is that just because you implement the things you saw on that slide doesn't necessarily mean that you've spun the flywheel and really gotten that process to work at scale and quickly across a many, uh, many different dimensions. And here are some common issues that we see around governance with our customers and in the marketplace today. And that's first of all, oftentimes governance programs are implemented in a very defensive context, right? Which makes sense, right? The thing that is obvious is that we don't want to get in trouble around GDPR or CCPA. We don't want to get in trouble with financial regulatory bodies. It's important that we safeguard the data, both for the purposes of sort of uh, not getting in trouble, but also because of trust with the consumer. We're trying to engender and build that trust with the end users and uh, any small PR fiasco can go a long way in losing that trust. Um, but what ends up happening often is that when, in, when these programs are implemented, they fixate very, very closely and, and almost uh, to an exclusion around some of those risk and compliance oriented aspects, which creates a disconnect because there may be certain processes or certain people that are focused around that. They implement certain solutions or policies in place, but it really has that focus in mind, not necessarily value creation or some of the other types of benefits that we'll talk about a little bit more in this deck. Um, oftentimes, these processes are not necessarily designed to be fast or agile. They're designed to do a lot of upfront work to design the right policies, to design the right standards, but those things can be uh, a bit immovable and a bit difficult to evolve over time, especially as the things change in the world, the changing regulatory environment, for example or the changing growth in data and complexity itself, right? Whether it's the volume of data, the velocity of data, or I think we've finally evolved now as a data management sort of universe. You know, I feel like we always were talking about the three Vs before, uh, sort of uh, the big data stage of, of, of development. But I think everyone now is really coming to appreciate and, and really see that the biggest problem here is complexity the sort of the variety and complexity of all the different systems and people and use cases is making it very hard for traditional models of governance to work in this new sort of landscape. And so one of the things that we want to figure out is how do we avoid these problems, right? And what ends up happening when these problems happen, uh, when we have the, uh, you know, challenges around actually accelerating business value, you run into a, a bunch of very common scenarios. And, uh, and here are a few sort of uh, images to, to kind of bring to light some of the emotions that maybe some of these may make you feel. And, and for those of you in the audience who are data practitioners and face these issues in your day to day, every day, every hour, I'm sure that this may hit a little bit of a nerve for you. Um, for example, you know, the data breadlines that form, right? We create these bottlenecks, these processes where, you know, you say, hey, I really need access to that data, you know, some data, please. Uh, and, uh, and that data takes, uh, you know, three months for it to get approved by this level, and then it's got to get approved by that level. And I think it's in somebody's inbox right now. I, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to email to figure out whose inbox it's in right now. I'm sure that those are all kind of uh, uh, feelings that, that resonate. Um, data silos forming, right? Just because we put these processes in place doesn't necessarily mean we're busting those silos and we're causing collaboration to happen. Silos can continue. And in fact, 
sometimes when you have a very defensive and lockdown oriented approach, it actually reinforces the silos because it's easier to manage a silo than it is sometimes to actually spread things across and, and really democratize. And so you don't have a forcing function that really causes that to expand and that collaboration to happen. Data is unclear exactly what the meaning is. You don't know what it's for. You don't know where the best data is. You have to fight. You have to fight politically or with your time or your energy in order to get the data that you need. Um, it's sometimes easier to just not try to fight for it. And that's not the kind of, uh, you know, uh, motivation uh, scenario that we want to put in place within our organizations. And then finally, just general literacy. Not everyone understands data and analytics in general and a defensive approach to governance doesn't necessarily encourage people to learn more about data and become more fluent in data and that's a motivation that we need to change uh, and a dynamic we have to change if we want to make things more inclusive and so what we're really looking at is can we switch from not just a defensive stance around governance but to move to offense and that really means data enablement. Can we use data and can we use governance as a function to actually accelerate business value creation in our different companies? And we really think of this as, hey, this is the data-driven organization. This is the vision that as, you know, whether you're a chief data officer or you're, you're, you're somebody who wears that hat or you're just somebody who cares about being more data-driven in your company, um, you want to pair data governance, the making sure that the information is managed properly, with this idea of data democratization, making sure that the information is accessible broadly. And the realization that really is a game changer is that actually these things are two sides of the same coin. The better you are at effective governance, the faster and easier it should be to make data available and accessible to the people that need it for the right use cases, right? And then there's this umbrella of data literacy that's over all of this, which is making sure that as we level up as an organization, we will be more effective at leveraging data properly, safely, in the right ways, as fast as possible. Um, and really these three things need to combine together. These are the ingredients for data-driven organizations that use data governance as an asset that accelerates value. Now I wanna introduce a concept here, which is something that we've been blogging about lately. So definitely go check out the data.world blog and you can learn a little bit more from our chief product officer about what does this mean when we talk about agile data governance. So I'm not gonna go into too much depth on the specific methodology today, but I do wanna introduce the concept so it's clear why this analogy is here and why we're really running with it. And for those of you that are familiar with software development, uh, in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a huge uh, groundswell and shift in the way that software is developed. And that is that we have moved primarily from what is called a waterfall approach, which is sort of, you know, uh, gather the requirements, uh, build the design, build the product, QA it, beta test, release. Uh, that is a very uh, a non-incremental and a very linear oriented, a stage gate oriented approach to being able to push out new software. And what would typically happen is you would never see companies deploy software in, you know, six months. Uh, I'm sorry, you would never see them deploy software in, you know, uh, weeks or days. You would see new software come out in six months or in a year or in two years, right? The, the cycles of iteration and improvement were very slow. Uh, and what we're kind of seeing and is interesting is that that same mentality of wanting to iterate is something that cannot just work in the software world, it can also work in the data world and in the governance world. And so some of the key principles around agile software development you see here, these are called the, the sort of the four key values of agile software development is first of all, the valuing of individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That's kind of radical when you think about it in the data governance sense, because you know, we often think about the processes and the tools as being the centerpiece of governance. But if we really think about it, if we could value individuals and our interactions with them above tools, not neglecting tools, but thinking of it as a means to an end, that really is a phase shift, a mind shift change. The idea of working software over comprehensive documentation, being able to do analysis with data over just documenting it for, for ages and ages until it's perfect, right, quote unquote, 
and then now it's ready to release to the masses. No, let's get it out there. Let's get people to use it and their usage will inform us on how to use, uh, how to write better documentation, how to build better process. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And in the context of data governance, customer collaboration are your end users. It's the analysts, it's the data scientists, it's the knowledge workers that need to use that data. We wanna focus on their use and collaboration and democratization and self-service of that data over just the contract negotiation piece. Are we, are we legal and compliance? Cool, I don't care, right? That is not the mentality that we want. Finally, responding to change. We have to be dynamic. It's not just about following the plan or, or a three-year roadmap, right? The three-year roadmap that you created three years ago is not relevant today, right? You're rewriting your roadmap uh, for your data organization every month probably, right? And so we have to be dynamic to change. And so let's walk through a little bit of a process here. What, is, what does this look like? How can agile data governance be put into practice in our organizations? And we actually have a white paper that we'll, we'll direct you to at the end of this webinar where you can learn a little bit more about this and, uh, and see in a little bit more detail. Uh, but in general, it starts with two key roles. There are people in our organization that are more of this producer persona. There are people that are creating the data, managing the systems of data, um, they're the ones that are upstream, if we're thinking of sort of a river here, right? Those are the data architects, the system administrators, the data engineers. They're the ones that are initially creating this data and have a very key role in the quality and the accessibility of that data downstream. And then you have the consumers. The consumers are the analysts, the data scientists, the machine learning engineers, the BI folks. And don't forget all the other knowledge workers in your organization. Sometimes it's easy to forget them. And, you know, we do talk to some uh, companies sometimes when they're thinking about their data catalog initiative, and they're only thinking about, oh, my, anal my data analyst and my data scientist. Well, think of all of the people in your organization that are consuming that, that Excel file or consuming that, uh, that Google spreadsheet um, and are emailing it around or are dropping it into a random folder in Box or OneDrive somewhere. Um, those people are knowledge workers that are leveraging data. And is the data that they're leveraging quality? Is it the most recent? Um, where did they get it from? What's the lineage? So really do think about them as being included in this process as well. And the expertise that they have and, and the feedback that they can drive back in, which we'll, we'll talk more about in a second. These are the people that are involved in this process, producers and consumers. But don't get over indexed on the roles that I put here in those bullet points, because that's really just for sort of illustration purposes. I want a starting point for where you can think about uh, in terms of who, who these people are. Um, these roles cannot be fixed, right? And you'll understand that in a second, because we want to take a use case driven approach here. And depending on the use case, depending on the situation, sometimes these roles can shift, right? A data engineer can be the source in one use case who's providing their downstream consumers. But in another use case, they may be the consumers. Somebody is providing them the data that they need that they can then transform for some purpose. And so you really do need to think of this as a use case by use case sort of situation. So use cases, what do we mean by that? These are business questions. They are business problems in your organization. And one of the shifts that we really talk to our customers about and really push them towards is not to just think about it as a process driven approach. What is the process we should start with? Not to start with regulation. Oh, what's the regulation that we should start with? Um, not to think about it from a system perspective. Hey, we've got this one database over here that people use a lot, let's start with that, right? Now you may end up consolidating your scope to focus on one of those things because as you start to refine the use cases, you may narrow in and highlight and target those specific things. In fact, that's the right thing to do. You do not want your scope in process regulation and systems to get out of hand. But you start with the business question because that's what's going to drive you to end user value, right? To go back to this idea of product management, the job of a product manager is to understand the market and understand their end users to then provide them business value. And in the same way, in our data organizations, our data product managers, whether they're data stewards or data custodians or whatever those key roles are in your organization that, is, that are, are putting on that data product management hat, they need to identify the key and important use cases in the organization, prioritize them in collaboration with executives and end users, 
in order to determine what is the business value, what is the highest business value, and then being able to prioritize that first. And so that's really what the, the source of this sort of, sort of agile data governance process is. And if you tune out everything else in this presentation and you just remember one thing, I hope that the one thing that you'll hold on to and recall is to take a use case driven approach and then iterate around those use cases to implement your governance program. So moving forward, the next step in this process is around curation. And we use curation pretty broadly here to mean the refining of those different information assets for the purposes of governance. And part of this is sort of connecting to different systems and documenting and tech contextualizing. You know, one of the things that a lot of our customers need to do is think about, hey, um, you know, uh, is this sensitive data? Um, is this data that is subject to this policy or that policy or this standard or that standard? And part of that process of documenting and defining and contextualizing is to build out those policies, connect them to different data assets and say, hey, this policy applies to this data asset connecting to those different systems to get them into here in the first place. But there's a reason why I put them lower in this list here, and you see collaborate and release early and peer review on top. And it's because we can very easily do a lot of work in this governance realm. It's very easy to go into the back room and be like, oh man, I gotta document these 5,000 tables and these 20,000 columns. Um, and you can spend months doing that, right? There's automation that can help, and we'll, we'll talk about automation in a second. Um, but, but you don't want to become uh, overly fixated on the work and, not, and, and lose sight of the benefit at the end of the tunnel. And so collaborating with your end users, the people who are going to use that data, including them in this process, and making sure that that curation activity that you're doing is the right activity is important to making this efficient. Enablement is key training, evangelism, building that community inside of your enterprise, whether it's a smaller community to start, or maybe you're going for more of an enterprise-wide depl enterprise deployment at the beginning, you wanna make sure that you're including them, that you're enabling them, that you're building that data literacy, because that's how they're gonna get the most value and use out of something like a catalog or a governance solution. And we wanna get them hands-on, include them, and make sure that you're thinking about data access from the beginning. Because if they can't get hands-on with the data, they can't get hands-on with the process, it's gonna be very hard for them to know and project how they're going to do that for analysis, right? It can all be a thought exercise, but unless you're thinking about how you can actually get your hands on data and get it in the hands of the end users, not just purely think of data governance as a metadata exercise, think of it as a metadata and data exercise that will make a huge difference in both the usability for end users as well as ensuring that you're thinking comprehensively about the problem. We've run into many customers that solve, try to solve this only with metadata, only to then run into a wall and have to figure out how they're gonna solve the data part of that equation later. And that's very hard to do in a retrospect. Next, we actually want to use the data, right? And that means the consumers are finding, understanding and trusting the data they understand what the quality is, they can browse it, they can experience it. This is really a, an important role of the catalog and then be able to request access to it. When they do have access, you want them to be able to analyze and work with that data and we want them to actually document what they're doing with the data. What's really, really critical and we've seen with a lot of our customers is that they go into the catalog and the governance, governance solution thinking of just about uh, an inventory and an index of sort of what's out there. And what they very quickly get to towards the end of that process is realize back to the point of use cases that it's really about the insight and the business value and the use cases that are coming out of it. And so um, if you can help people to understand what the use cases are and actually build a use case catalog and an analysis catalog, that can be way more valuable than a data catalog. I mean, the data catalog is table stakes, right? You have to have it in order to get to the second piece of it. But those recipes, let's call them, of how to do analysis for different use cases can get you so much farther than you know, simply knowing that a table exists and what's in that column, right? And what this does is it all feeds back, right? Those questions get answered, but they create new questions. And when you, ex when you show people those use case recipes and when they're learning about how the data is being used, it brings up new questions that we wanna answer from an analysis perspective and it brings up new ideas for new sets of data, new processes, new standards that need to be put in place 
to grow this process so that we can include more. And what's important is this learn and iterate piece right on top here. The producers don't just release it, right? It doesn't stop at enable and you say, okay, it's out there, I've released it, bye-bye now, right? You actually need to be involved with them to measure what they're doing, to audit what they're doing, to collaborate with them, to advise them. And these people are gonna be involved in things like crowdsourcing and in the requesting of access. So producers and consumers have to keep working together throughout this entire process through the iteration loop back to the next use case. So that's where this loop is, and that's where this gets agile, is that we want to do this process as fast as possible, end to end, and then loop it back. And it's all about rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. This is the process that we want to iterate over and over and over again. And actually, just uh, to explain something, I'm going to skip forward a little bit, and then I'm going to go back. So this is kind of the normal process that we typically look at, right? It's, hey, let's define our standards, let's define our policies, let's build our workflows, let's do our release. We don't really get to refine too much, but you attempt to along the way, right? You're doing it sort of internally without enough sort of end perspective. Uh, and then you're trying to do a loop on that. And this is like a six or 12 month iteration. That's not very agile, right? This is just waterfall on repeat. The agile process is, let's define those standards and principles let's define those policies so we need to include these different roles the stewards the trustee the custodians the architects but we're also including the end users the people that are using the data and we're including as part of this cycle the analysis the insights and the value we're including the iteration which means we have to measure we have to audit we have to engage with people we have to do peer reviews and then we can have to and then we have to make this as fast as possible we have to try to repeat it and so what you end up having is the ability to stay focused on that first use case and then iterate, 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 iterate. And the idea is that when you do this successfully, and we've seen this work at many, many of the customers that we're working with, is that when you approach this iteratively, when you look at it based on a use case perspective, you can implement your governance program and your cataloging initiative uh, in just a matter of 30 to 60 days, sometimes faster than that, but you know, let's not overpromise here. Like you can implement this program extremely quickly, focused on that use case, and then iterate your way into a much larger implementation. And that's hugely powerful because it means that you're being more effective at governance, you're keeping the scope tight, and you're growing that over time. And this is really what this agile governance process is all about. So I'm going to back up here and show a couple other slides and then uh, uh, we'll pause for a second before we do any demoing. Um, one of the topics we wanted to talk about was around AI and ML and automation. And there's definitely a lot of excitement in both the sort of cataloging realm as well as the governance realm around what the role of the role is of that. And, you know, uh, are there any magic pills that we can take? that will, uh, will allow us to just have governance happen somehow, that it's just gonna kind of, there's gonna be some magic element. And I know we are, we're all practical people, right? We, we know that uh, there is no such thing as a magic pill, right? But hey, you know, AI and ML has advanced a lot. We do want and hope that there's gonna be a huge change here, a huge impact. Uh, and the answer is, is that things have evolved a lot, right? There are some ways that AI and machine learning can have a strong impact. And I kind of encompass this down in this bottom right-hand corner here, which, which I call machine intelligence. And this is the role of these different automated processes in helping to build intelligence in our organization. However, it alone is not enough. And in fact, it is only one leg of sort of a three-legged stool, and it may not even be the most important leg to really get an effective governance program working in your organization. The other two legs, which are just as important, if not more important, are at the top here, you see expertise or expert intelligence. This is a little bit more of the traditional roles that you think about in your organization, like the steward, for example. The steward is this person who is meant to be at sort of the crossroads between business and technical, a person who understands the data, who can answer questions about the data, who can ensure the quality of that data in an ongoing fashion, can steward the life cycle of that, right? Those experts are essential and can't be automated. That expertise is not, not, it's not at all easily automatable, right? Um, you can teach something to do tags and you can say, hey, um, you know, I've been tagging these 25 things in a similar way. Like I'd like to have 
that apply um, in general. And that's where you're taking that steward knowledge, right? Because they tagged those first 10 or 15 or 25 things, and now you're scaling it. So it's actually a scaling factor on top of expertise. So that's just to put some things in context here in terms of how these things amplify each other and are actually very tightly intertwined and connected. The third piece here is crowdsourcing. And that's where I think there's a lot of innovation potential. And this is actually an area where we'll show a brief demo today, which is that you can actually get other people in your organization providing their expertise into the process. Because in the end, you can't make every single person in your organization a data steward. That's not practical. That's not possible. Um, the data stewards are always going to be a more focused selection of people. But those people, the broader audience, has expertise. They know how to use the data. They're using the data in practice. They have uh, ideas of, of Janet over in finance who knows something about that data that the steward didn't know about. How do you make sure that this flywheel, this connectedness in our organizations actually builds up towards a collective intelligence if all you're doing is including expertise and some automation wrapped around that expertise? The answer is you can't, and you need to engage the broader set of people in your organization through what we're kind of calling crowdsourcing here, but really is crowd intelligence. And just to add uh, a little animation to this, you can see these are some of the things that really fit into some of these different buckets. You heard me talk about expert roles. You heard me talking about crowdsourcing and sort of inclusion there. And then finally, on the machine intelligence side, the three main areas of machine intelligence that we see as being most valuable are machine learning, right? Can I do things like automate tagging or automate relationships um, onto some of these different fields that allows me to, to scale my steward efforts? Rules-based approaches, especially useful in cases where maybe you've got some sensitive data and you just wanna say, hey, anytime it's you know uh, nine digits and it's got some dashes, that's a social security number. That's an oversimplification, but that's the kind of use case where rules-based approaches are extremely effective. And then finally, an area where data.world I think really stands out and shines a lot is around the graph and semantics piece. And that's where as you're building knowledge, as you're connecting in this data, this analysis and these people, what's going to end up happening is themes are going to form. You're going to want to be able to create abstractions and structure and hierarchy on top of that and do things like natural language processing. Do things like be able to query your data as though the data were your glossary. I know these are some out there ideas, but th these are the kinds of things that graph and semantic allows you to do and why you see folks like Gartner and others saying things like data catalog and data governance is the first step on the path to building your enterprise knowledge graph. So these are the pieces that come together to really create an AI and ML and automation in this landscape uh, and how uh, at data.world we kind of think of these three things really working together and helping each other. So what are some of the business values that shake out of all this? Well, we'll kind of wrap this up with the business value and then a quick demo. The impact of being inclusive. When you are including all the people in your organization, you're able to bring expertise from wherever it may be. Now, you may have expert roles, but there are a lot of people that understand about the context of that data in ways that's going to be able to add to that value. And there are people that are using data in unexpected ways and the stewards and the product owners need to be able to figure out that information in order to do their job better so they can iterate better so they can spend less time curating and they can spend more time creating business value. Um, so you've got to engage all those people and get that expertise out there. User friendliness is also very critical. And when you are inclusive and you include a lot of people, it forces you to create a data catalog that isn't just a place to nerd out, right? It has to be a place where everyone can get value from data. It has to feel like Google for searching, Facebook for discovery. It has to feel like Amazon for data shopping. And user friendliness is key to all of that. And reusability. The whole point of a catalog and a governance solution isn't just to sort of protect the company. It isn't just to create this business, uh, this, val this business value. It's to create an exponential knowledge engine. Whereas people are doing analysis as they're working on these different things, that knowledge then feeds back. And reusability is critical to that in, toward, in terms of doing that effectively, in terms of doing it uh, efficiently, uh, and doing it at scale. We talked about this, so we'll skip through that, and we'll go to the innovation and business value. 
you can expect when you implement agile data governance that you will achieve faster speed. We think of this as self-service consumption, where you're able to go and find the data that you need, you're able to understand the context around it. Um, as a data producer, you're able to build the context around that and do that all quickly to try to eliminate those data breadlines. You should not have to wait months and months for an important data set to get documented. You should not have to wait months and months in order to get access to a data product that exists in your organization. Visibility. You want to see the data that's out there and you want to be able to bring it together in order to eliminate those silos and eliminate those rogue databases or rogue data processes. And that means creating a map to all those things out there and seeing how they connect through things like lineage. It means things being uh, like being able to query that data, right? If you can go to one place to see that something exists, but then you have to go to the thousand different places in order to get access to the data, that does not help with breaking those silos. It continues to reinforce them. Clarity, you want to have as much context as possible so that you can eliminate those data obscurity problems. And then finally, democratization. You want to enable people to get their hands on the data where they don't have to fight. They're not fighting for resources. There isn't uh, that one analyst that 100 people are sharing that they have to get in the queue uh, and they've got to do, uh, you know, they've got to send really, really nice notes to the boss's boss in order to get access to that analyst. Um, we have to find ways to unlock scale and iteration uh, and allow all different people from all different parts of the organization to work together on these projects. So this is some of the value that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and just before we kind of go to the demo here, you know, just to loop you back in, Theresa, I'm, I'm curious, you know, based on what you've seen with the study with NTT that you all have been working on, which is, which is awesome, and I hope that everyone goes and checks that out, um, how does this kind of resonate with some of the things you've seen there and in general what you've seen uh, sort of in the marketplace? Yeah, definitely it resonates for sure. And this, this whole idea of speed and trending, you know, everything is going to be moving faster coming out of this pandemic and trends that we had seen just sort of on the edge are all of a sudden being pushed to the forefront. You know, one of the things I loved your chart with all of the beautiful colors where you talk about the waterfall and then you talk about agile. That, however, is going to, when you do a process, when you do that complete process on a very small project and then you do the next one, the governance team takes on a different sort of responsibility. Now it's their responsibility, just like you said in these slides, to make sure that they manage those learnings across all the different projects that are happening at one time. So that becomes a very important part for what they, they're doing. That's why governance in any form, and you know, we need another word for it probably, because governance has started to mean policing, which is not what's intended to be. You know, it needs to be something that's much more positive in how we approach it, like you said here, how we make that data democratize it so that everybody has access to it. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I, I know, I know it's hard sometimes to create new terms. And so, you know, I've, I've heard folks throw around data enablement, which I really love. Um, I, I love the idea of, you know, data management and sort of data fabric, including things like governance. But, you know, wherever we land from a terminology standpoint, I certainly hope that, uh, that we move in this direction as a space, because I think it's the way that we scale these sort of things effectively. Um, and I love your point about um, the governance function changing a little bit. I think that's really key because I think uh, we've always thought of governance as being uh, traditionally, right, um, sort of a, a, a function that creates a structure and says, you know, please fit within this structure. And really, they have to do as good of a job as they can to wrap their hands around as much as they can, right, which is getting harder and harder because it's, there's more data, there's more systems, it's getting, we're moving to the cloud, and now it's like, where is it? I don't know where it is, right? Um, that um, they have to really be more of a, a function that's creating the right, it's kind of like train the trainer. They need to create little governance pods throughout the organization and really be sort of spinning the flywheel to get it working in a broader way because just getting their arms around the whole thing themselves doesn't really make sense anymore. No, they have to be looking at themselves as process owners instead of product or solutions owners. It's a very different sort of view of the world. 
Yeah. And pushing that sort of responsibility and accountability down into the organization to sort of achieve some scale. No, that's really great. And I, I think just to kind of finish this off here, I'll show you a very quick demo just to tease some of the functionality around this, and then we'll kind of switch over to questions. So um, what I'll do here is switch over to my other window. Um, so let's zoom in a little bit. So here you can see I'm logged into data.world um, as an analyst. His name is Bob. And uh, one of the things that Bob may want to do is, you know, search for, for data in the organization and, and actually start to do some analysis. And so let's say he uh, wants to find some data around the retail orders uh, in his particular company because he wants to analyze shipping or profitability related to those orders. And so he can see things like uh, business glossary terms. Um, he can see that um, some of these terms have gone through a certification process showing uh, that an expert person, right, this is where we're embedding some expert intelligence into the system, has said that this is a good asset. I recommend the use of this. You can see things like facets and filters in the search that allows us to drill down into just the things that are approved, just the things that uh, maybe are uh, not confidential and not sensitive. Uh, perhaps things that come from particular sources. So you can see how, you know, what you're doing here is you want to try to embed a lot of these different governance concepts as much as possible in seamless ways so that it doesn't feel like sort of a workflow or a process where you're sort of waiting in that data breadline. It's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. It's integrated into the overall user experience. And when you look at things like data, for example, you want to make sure that as much of the information is there as possible, but not more than what you need in order to make a good and trusted decision about that data. For example, you may want to look a little bit at some different data quality metrics. You may want to know what is the PII in this, in this particular um, table or data set. You may want to be able to look at what are the applicable policies and standards associated with this data so that I can make sure that I'm using it in compliance uh, with the intended use. And you may want to do things like look at some of the approved um, sorts of uh, dashboards and things like that that are that are connected with this to not just understand what the well-governed data is, but also what the well-governed um, actual dashboards and things are. And so I'm going to hop over and look at something like this commission model dashboard, where again, we have all that sort of great metadata we can see, you know, a preview, which is an optional thing here. Some of our customers turn this off, but it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, and then say, you know what, this is the analysis I want to use. Now, the thing that I want to show and kind of end this off with is we talked a little bit about crowdsourcing and the key of engaging the crowd and getting more of that expertise and knowledge out from the sort of the general audience in our organizations and bringing that into this process. And so one of the things that's unique to data.world, this is a feature that's currently in private beta, so you're getting kind of a sneak sort of a VIP preview here, is this idea of suggesting changes to data. So I'm just a viewer here, right? And this really gets me into sort of this model that's very similar to um, like a Google Docs, or uh, if you're using Office 365, you know, something like a Words 365 situation, where um, I wanna suggest some changes. And um, this is great because one of the things that we see a lot of companies struggle with when they implement a governance or a catalog solution is they get stuck into sort of, I call it a role hell. Um, you get stuck in role hell where you're trying to figure out like, what, how do I define the exact right rights for an, a, a given user to have that, uh, you know, they can do the right amount of stuff, but they can't do this and they can see that thing, but they can't see that thing. And you can imagine how complicated that gets. And it's already complicated from a data access perspective. And now you're going to introduce that on the metadata side, right? You can see how that that's a ball of yarn that you can get stuck in. Um, but this idea of a suggestion tier is very powerful because that means that you can allow varying levels of people to suggest things. And if it's a bad suggestion, a suggestion you reject it. If it's a good suggestion, now we're including it in our collective intelligence. And so let's say I want to suggest an additional table to be added here, right? And so let's say that there's an additional table here, this sales order table that I'd like to add. I can easily as an end user select that and say, let me add that. Let me review my changes here and say, um, hey, steward, um, I really think this table is important because it was used for analysis like this. 
Um, obviously, you should do a better job of writing your business case when you're when you're trying to lobby for a steward to approve this. But assume that uh, I did a good job here. And I'll save this one change. And now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch over to the data steward now. So I'm going to pop out and Sarah Smart is our data steward. She's the one who's in charge uh, of that table in terms of uh, helping with its quality lifecycle, answering questions and sort of approving some of the metadata changes around it. And uh, what's really cool is that now in this upper right hand corner here, we can see that two seconds ago, 19 seconds ago, it's all real time here, Democorp Bob, he has suggested some changes. And so I can click on that changes link and I can see that, okay, Bob has made a suggestion. He thinks that we should add this table. Let me go ahead and show this message. And you know what? I agree with this. We should, we should, we think we should include this, right? Um, and I could easily say approve suggestions. And now when I scroll down, you'll see that now sales order is a part of this. So that just goes to show, you know, you don't need a complicated workflow or, um, you know, to spend three or six months designing uh, a process to accommodate uh, agile governance. It's something that can be embedded into your processes. It can be embedded in your approach and in your technology when you, when you work with uh, tools like data.world. Now, just to end this off, I will remove this because you can see that's red. So it's like, oh, that was a bad idea. I shouldn't have added that. So let's go ahead and kill that. Now it's been removed. So the power of being a steward. So thanks everyone for kind of checking that out. With that, I will switch back over to um, the slides here. Um, we'll put this up right here. And uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Tizi. Sure. So we, we got some very good questions from the audience today. I have one from Samir and uh, he's touching in, in two terms that Teresa brought up to the presentation. Is there a difference between a data owner role with a data custodian? Are they the That's same? That's a really great question. Um, I can start with that and I'm curious, uh, Teresa, your, your, your kind of thought process there. Um, from my perspective, a lot of times I see organizations kind of use them interchangeably. Uh, oftentimes a data owner is uh, a, a technical person who uh, you know, if they need to make a change to a database or maybe they need to provision the user on the database, typically they are the more technical user. Um, I think data custodian has a little bit of a more uh, regulatory and compliance kind of bent to it versus data owner, which is a little bit more sort of generic stewardship and governance. Um, I have seen some companies, though, use the term data owner to mean data steward. So I think that, you know, these terms can be uh, used and abused, and it really depends on what the vocabulary is for your organization. Um, so at least that's, that's been my sort of what I've seen. I'm, I'm curious, to, uh, Theresa, if you've seen kind of something similar there. Yeah, I actually have seen uh, data owner belong to the business side of the house because the, the IT or the solutions people don't want to own the data. They want the business to own it. And then the custodians become part of the governance process, whether that's, uh, and usually that's a mixture, that's the person that sits in between somewhere in a data management organization that's taking care, making sure it's clean enough to be managed and that it's accessible. But, you know, it's ownership, ownership equates to accountability. And that's the one thing that has to happen is that you can't own something without being responsible and accountable for it. And I've seen a lot of people who want to own it without, without necessarily that side of the responsibility included. Yeah, the, the responsibility part is important there. And, and sometimes terms like data owner can be a little confusing. So one best practice I, I've seen lately in a couple of our customers is actually to call them like a, a tech owner versus a business owner. And sometimes you when you do things like that, you can create a little more clarity. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. So in an established enterprise, don't you need to have a more, take a more arbitrary approach internally uh, in order to get people to change? Can you repeat that question one more time? Sure. So if you are already in an inter established enterprise, um, isn't necessary to take a more arbitrary policing approach to governance? Otherwise, it wouldn't be too hard to get people to actually um, be open to change. People, people change when good... they see value to something. And unless you're producing value for data, unless it's in an easy, accessible way, yeah, you may have to use some time 
uh, tyrannical approaches to making sure that people are using the data appropriately. However, I will say in some highly regulated industries, there are reasons why you do strict governance for things for your data, because you can get in big trouble. And that is, you know, my boss said to me the other day, just do this to make sure that you keep me out of jail. And that's, that's exactly one of the things that has to happen with some of the data that we manage and make available. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and I think what's important as a takeaway here is that agile governance uh, as a concept should not be thought of as a way to uh, make light of the importance and the business criticality of being safe and making sure that you're, you're staying out of jail, that you're following the right processes that these things, these more traditional models and the idea of agile, agile data governance need to come together to form a faster and more iterative approach, a more business value driven approach, while still not forgetting that you need to make sure to do the right things and have the right top down oversight and, you know, executive sponsorship uh, to do the right things and actually get people to follow these, these approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time, so we have some questions we're going to follow up afterwards. I want to thank you both for the panelists, Teresa and Tim, for your time today. And for the audience, if you want to learn more about the topic that we covered today, go ahead and, and download the Agile Data Governance White Paper that we are highlighting here in, in the presentation. Thank you very much and have a good day.